Greetings from the headquarters of Naval Aviation Forces in San Diego, California, the birthplace of Naval Aviation. As a Navy's Air Boss, I'm pleased and honored to introduce this video, Wings for the Navy, which celebrates the centennial of Naval Aviation. Welcome aboard. I know you will enjoy the inspirational story of the brave pioneers who forged our Naval Aviation's legacy. It's hard to imagine the Navy without the aircraft carrier. These floating naval bases project America's power to the four corners of the Earth, serving as a launch point for the world's most sophisticated combat aircraft. But how did it happen? What momentous event led to the transformation of the modern Navy into one so heavily reliant on air power? It actually had humble beginnings a century ago when a small handful of men driven by their faith and ambition dared to dream and defy the odds. This is the story of how it all happened, how courage and ingenuity gave the United States what it would need to be a dominant power in the 20th century. This is the story of Wings for the Navy, a celebration of 100 years of naval aviation. Eugene Burton Ely was born in 1879 and came of age at a pivotal time. American ingenuity was advancing at an exciting pace. It was a time of invention with breakthroughs in electricity, communications, and transportation technology. As a young man in San Francisco, Ely sold and raced automobiles. It was there he met Miss Mabel Hall who shared his bold embrace of the future. They married and moved to Portland, Oregon, where Eugene got a job working for Henry Wemmy, a businessman who was fascinated by another new invention, the airplane. When Wemmy purchased an early biplane from Glenn Curtis, a self-taught mechanic and rising inventor, Ely offered to fly it for him, thinking flying a plane must be as simple as driving a car. It wasn't. Ely crashed and, feeling responsible, purchased the wrecked plane from his employer. Carefully repairing the craft, Ely began to understand the aerodynamic principles involved in flight, and soon, with Mabel acting as his publicist, he was flying his biplane in exhibitions. It was inevitable that Ely and Curtis would join forces. After getting his airplane in Oregon, Ely started the circuit, and in June, he was doing, an air, doing air shows in Minneapolis. At that point, he was observed by Glenn Curtis, who was always looking for uh, pilot material to help sell his airplanes. He saw uh, Eugene Ely and immediately uh, hired him as part of his team. It was an exciting time to be in aviation. Man flight had captured the public's imagination. Like their counterparts around the world, both the U.S. Army and Navy were beginning to explore aviation as a weapon of war. Curtis also realized the potential of the military as a market for his planes. Glenn Curtis took an early interest in aircraft designs that could take off from and land on the surface of the water, a design that he would later call the hydro aeroplane and what aviators a few years after that would call the seaplane. When Ely and Curtis attended an October 1910 air meet in New York, they happened to meet Captain Washington Chambers, the Navy's officer assigned to administer aviation matters. Chambers was no expert when it came to flying machines, but it turned out he was well suited for the job. Chambers had spent a lot of his career both at the torpedo base and at the Naval War College innovating in designs and engineering as well as innovating in the policies and tactics the Navy was using at the time. While Chambers was assigned the task of developing aviation, the Navy didn't provide much in the way of support for his efforts. He had no staff. He had no fixed offices. He had no budget. Essentially, he'd been assigned to a position where he was supposed to explore something as long as it didn't cost the Navy anything but his time. 
Unofficially, the Navy remains skeptical of aviation. Twelve years earlier, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt advocated experiments on Samuel Langley's pioneering flying machine, but received little support. The Army, however, was exploring the military uses of the airplane. The Navy sent observers to a series of test flights in 1908, conducted by the Wright brothers at Fort Myer, Virginia. But the board maintained the position that naval aviation was something whose time had not yet come. The more Chambers learned about airplanes, however, the more intrigued he became with the possibility of naval aviation. But how exactly would the Navy use a plane? Chambers began to think outside the box. He wasn't seeing a flat top carrier as it is today. But I do think he definitely understood that if aviation was going to be useful to the Navy in the long term, it really had to develop in a way that would allow us to launch and recover aboard the ship. The alternative, of course, was a seaplane. Curtis had done pioneering work in this area at his headquarters on Lake Cuca in upstate New York. In the context of the time around 1910, 1911, the Navy was based almost exclusively in harbors and river areas, so having an aircraft that was designed to operate from the water at the time made a lot of sense. However, a few years later, in the context of combat in the First World War, the Royal Navy discovered that seaplanes had certain disadvantages. By the time Chambers encountered Ely and Curtis at Belmont, New York, he was ready to try a takeoff from a ship. But how? Navy ships had no room to take off or land. Chambers had already spoken to the other U.S. titans of aviation, Orville and Wilbur Wright. The Wright brothers wanted no part of such an experiment, branding it as dangerously foolhardy. Though Curtis still preferred the seaplane approach, his pilot, Eugene Ely, rose to the challenge. Captain Chambers found uh, Ely in Baltimore and ask him if he would do it. The simple answer was, I can do that. Chambers had no money for this project, so Ely and Curtis agreed to do it at their own expense. Chambers did arrange for the light cruiser USS Birmingham to serve as the launch vessel. Workers at the Norfolk Navy Yard hastily constructed a wooden platform 80 feet long and 24 feet wide on Birmingham's forecastle. The platform sloped at five degrees with its forward edge 37 feet above the waterline. On 14 November 1910, just over a month following the chance meeting with Chambers, the pusher biplane was loaded aboard USS Birmingham, moored alongside a pier at the Navy Yard. Birmingham then headed down the Elizabeth River toward the Chesapeake Bay. Because severe weather, rain and hail, was closing in, Birmingham anchored one quarter mile off Old Point Comfort. Ely's flight gear was a curious ad hoc collection typical of an enterprise lacking a budget. His headgear was a well-used leather football helmet. For a personal flotation device, Ely couldn't swim and was deathly afraid of the water. Two bicycle inner tubes crisscrossed his chest. The weather was deteriorating fast and it became obvious to Ely that if he did not get it done that then, the Navy staff and the newspaper media would depart Hampton Roads, go back to Washington saying, they couldn't do it, we told you so. Without waiting for the ship to raise its anchor and begin moving, Ely took his place in the seat of the biplane, gave the signal, and revved the engines. 57 foot of roll with no wind across the deck. He gained most of his airspeed in the fall from the bow of the ship to the water. Indeed, when the tiny plane reached the end of the platform, it plunged dangerously toward the water, only to rise just in the nick of time. The wheels, however, touched a wave, kicking up spray. The spray of the water does two things. One, it damages the tips of the propeller blade, and two, the water is in his face. He tries to rub the water off his goggles, but his go gloves are covered with oil. So now he can't see where he's going and he's trying to get control of the airplane, uh, fly it and get his goggles cleared off. Ely is airborne, but the weather is nasty and the plane is vibrating. 
Worse still, Ely doesn't know where he is. The first land he sees is Willoughby Spit, but he doesn't know that. He puts it down on the beach at Willoughby Spit, thinking he had failed. A woman runs out of a house and he yells at her, where am I? And she yells back, you're between my house and the yacht club. Ely initially considered the experiment a failure because of the improvised landing, but Chambers saw it differently, and now he wanted to see more. Could Ely both take off and land a plane on a ship? Another test was quickly arranged. This one would be a greater challenge and would take place all the way across the country in San Francisco Bay. Curtis, meanwhile, quickly responded to the success of the Birmingham experiment by taking the initiative with the Navy. Glenn Curtis offered not only a design such as his hydro aeroplane that could operate where the Navy already was, i.e. harbor and river installations, but also was clever enough to offer free instruction in pilot training to both Army and Navy officers, unlike the Wright brothers. The Navy quickly took Curtis up on his offer. Early in 1911, Lieutenant Theodore Ellison was ordered to report to Curtis's North Island facility for training and was later to be designated Naval Aviator No. 1. Before the Birmingham flight, Chambers worried the ship might run over the plane and pilot if the launch failed and the craft went into the sea. After Ely proved the plane could take off with the ship at anchor, there was now greater flexibility. When a wooden platform was built on USS Pennsylvania, berthed in San Francisco Bay, the platform was constructed aft, allowing for a longer and wider runway. Though the Pennsylvania experiment would be far more demanding, Ely went into it with a greater degree of confidence than the Birmingham experiment. When it came to the Pennsylvania, he had the advantage. He'd done it once, he knew it could be done, and he also had a longer r deck run. On 18 January 1911, everything was ready. Ely took off in his Curtis Pusher from Selfridge Field, circled the bay at 1,500 feet, then made a slow descent toward the Pennsylvania. To slow the plane once it touched down, 22 parallel lines were stretched across the deck and attached to sailor's sea bags filled with sand at each end, with the lines about 12 inches above the surface of the deck. Three sets of steel hooks were attached to the bottom of the plane to grab the lines as it touched down. At 11.01 a.m., having slowed to 40 miles per hour, Ely cut the engine when he was 75 feet from Pennsylvania's fantail. The pusher silently glided toward the center of the deck, snagging the lines and rolling quickly to a stop, dragging the sea bags after it. It was a perfect landing. In the moments following the landing, excitement broke out on the deck of the ship among those who witnessed the event. It was though they could sense something momentous had just occurred. After having lunch with Mabel and a host of dignitaries aboard Pennsylvania, Ely took off in his pusher and returned to Selfridge Field. Though he might not have realized it at that moment, Ely had just demonstrated the possibility of the aircraft carrier. The arresting hook system with the sandbags had been the brainchild of Ely and fellow Curtis pilot Hugh Robinson at Curtis's new aviation training center at San Diego's North Island. The same basic design can be found today on the Navy's modern carriers. The USS Pennsylvania experiment was a sensation, making Ely front page news across the country. He was quoted in the March 1911 Naval Institute proceedings as saying, there was never a doubt in my mind that I would affect a successful landing. I knew what a Curtis biplane would do. The Pennsylvania experiment captured the public imagination because it reflected the public mood of the day. I think aviation in the 1910 time frame is what the X Games are today. You had a lot of public interest because people were doing things that no one had ever seen before.